Among the Imposters by Margaret Peterson Haydix. Page one, chapter one. Sometimes he whispered his real name in the dark, in the middle of the night. Luke, my name is Luke. He was sure no one could hear. His roommates were all asleep, and even if they weren't, there was no way the sound of his name could travel even the short distance to the bed above or beside him. He was fairly certain there were no bugs on him or in his room. He'd looked, but even if he missed seeing a microphone hidden in a mattress button or carved into the headboard, how could a microphone pick up a whisper he could barely hear himself? He was safe now. Lying in bed, wide awake while everyone else slept, he reassured himself of that fact constantly, but his heart pounded and his face went clammy with fear every time he rounded his lips for that U sound instead of the fake smile of the double E in Lee the name he had to force himself to answer to now. It was better to forget, to never speak his real name again, but he'd lost everything else. Even just mouthing his name was a comfort. It seemed like his only link now to his past, to his parents, his brothers, to Jen. By day, he kept his mouth shut. He couldn't help it. That first day, walking up the stairs of the Hendricks School for Boys with Jen's father, Luke had felt his jaw clench tighter and tighter the closer he got to the front door. Oh, don't look like that, Mr. Talbot had said, pretending to be jolly. It's not reform school or anything. The word stuck in Luke's brain, reform, reform. Yes, they were going to reform him. They were going to take a Luke and make him a Lee. It was safe to be Lee. It wasn't safe to be Luke. Jen's father stood with his hand on the ornate doorknob, waiting for a reply, but Luke couldn't have said a word if his life depended on it. Jen's father hesitated, then pulled on the heavy door. They walked down a long hallway. The ceiling was so far away. Luke thought he could have stood his entire family on his shoulders, one on top of the other, dad and mother and Matthew and Mark, and the highest one still would barely touch. The walls were lined floor to ceiling with old paintings of people in costumes Luke had never seen outside of books. Of course, there was very little he'd ever seen outside of books. He tried not to stare because if he really were Lee, surely everything would look familiar and ordinary, but that was hard to remember. They passed a classroom where dozens of boys sat in orderly rows, everyone facing away from the door. Luke gawked for so long that he practically began walking backwards. He'd known there were a lot of people in the world, but he'd never been able to imagine so many all in one place at the same time. Were any of them shadow children with fake identities like Luke? Jen's father clapped a hand on his shoulder, turning him around. Ah, here's the headmaster's office, Mr. Talbot said heartily. Just what we were looking for. Luke nodded, still mute, and followed him through a tall doorway. A woman sitting behind a mammoth wood desk turned their way. She took one look at Luke and asked, new boy? Lee Grant, Jen's father said. I spoke with the master about him last night. It's the middle of the semester, you know, she said warningly. Unless he's very well prepared, he shan't catch up and might have to repeat. That won't be a problem, Mr. Talbot assured her. Luke was glad he didn't have to speak for himself. He knew he wasn't well prepared. He wasn't prepared for anything. The woman was already reaching for files and papers. His parents faxed in his medical information and his insurance standing and his academic records last night, she said, but someone needs to sign these. Jen's father took the stack of papers as if he autographed other people's documents all the time. Probably he did. Luke watched Mr. Talbot flip through the papers, scrawling his name here, crossing out a word or a phrase or a whole, whole paragraph there. Luke was sure Jen's father was going too fast to actually read any of it. And that was when the homesickness hit Luke for the first time. He could just picture his own father peering cautiously at important papers, reading them over and over before he even picked up a pen. Luke could see his father's roomy eyes squinted in concentration, his bro brow furrowed with anxiety. He was always so afraid of being tricked. Maybe Jen's father didn't care. 
Luke had to swallow hard then. He made a gulping noise and the woman looked at him. Luke couldn't read her expression, curiosity, contempt, indifference. He didn't think it was sympathy. Jen's father finished then, handing the papers back to the woman with a flourish. I'll call a boy to show you your room, the woman said to Luke. Luke nodded. The woman leaned over a box on her desk and said, Mr. Dirk, could you send Raleigh Sturgeon to the office? Luke heard a roar along with the man's reply. Yes, Miss Hawkins, as if all the boys in the school were laughing and cheering and hissing at once. Luke felt his legs go weak with fear. When this Raleigh Sturgeon showed up, Luke wasn't sure he'd be able to walk. Well, I'll be off, Jen's father said, duty calls. He stuck out his hand and after a moment, Luke realized he was supposed to shake it, but he'd never shaken hands with anyone before, so he put out the wrong hand first. Jen's father frowned, moving his head violently side to side and glaring pointedly at the woman behind the desk. Fortunately, she wasn't watching. Luke recovered. He clumsily touched his hand to Jen's father. father's. Good luck, Jen's father said, bringing his other hand up to Luke's too. Only when Mr. Talbot had pulled both hands away did Luke realize he'd placed a tiny scrap of paper between Luke's fingers. Luke held it there until the woman turned her back. Then he slid it into his pocket. Jen's father smiled. Keep those grades up, he said, and no running away this time, you hear? Luke gulped again and nodded. And then Jen's father left without a backward glance. Chapter two. Luke wanted to read the note from Mr. Talbot right away. He was sure it would tell him everything, everything he needed to know to survive Hendrick's school for boys. No, to survive anything that might come his way in his new life outside hiding. It was just one thin scrap of paper. Now that it was in his pocket, Luke couldn't even feel it there. But he had faith. Jen's father had hidden Luke from the population police, double-crossing his own employer. He'd gotten Luke his fake ID so he could move about as freely as anyone else, anyone who wasn't an illegal third child. Jen's father had risked his career helping Luke. No, it was more than that. He'd risked his life. Surely Mr. Talbot would have written something incredibly wise. Luke slid his hand into his pocket, his fingertips touching the top of the note. Miss Hawkins was looking away. Maybe. The door opened behind Luke. Luke jerked his hand out of his pocket. Scared you, didn't I? A boy jeered. Made you jump. Luke was used to being teased. He had older brothers, after all. Matthew, but Matthew and Mark's teasing never sounded quite so mean. Still, Luke knew he had to answer. Sure, I'm jumpy like a cat, Luke started to say. It was an expression of his mother's. Being cat jumpy was good, like being quick on his feet. Just in time, Luke remembered he couldn't mention cats. Cats were illegal, too, outlawed because they might take food that was supposed to go to starving humans. Back home, Luke had seen wild cats a few times, stalking the countryside. Dad had liked having them around because they ate rats and mice that might eat his grain. But if Luke were really Lee Grant, filthy rich city boy, he wouldn't know a thing about cats, jumpy or otherwise. He clamped his mouth shut, closing off his shirt in a wimpy hiss. He kept his head down, too scared to look at the other boy right in the eye. The boy laughed, cruelly. He looked past Luke to Miss Hawkins. What's wrong with him? The boy asked, as if Luke weren't even there. Can't talk or something? Luke wanted Miss Hawkins to stick up for him, to say, he's just new. Don't you remember what that's like? But she wasn't even paying attention. She frowned at the boy. Raleigh, take him to room 156. There's an empty bed in there. Just put a suitcase down. Don't waste time unpacking. Then take him back to Mr. Dirk's history class with you. He's already behind. Lord knows what his parents were thinking. Raleigh shrugged and turned around. I did not dismiss you, Miss Hawkins shrieked. May I be dismissed? Raleigh asked mockingly. That's better, Miss Hawkins said. Now get. Go on with you. Luke picked up his suitcase and followed, hoping Raleigh's request for dismissal would work for both of them. Either it did or Miss Hawkins didn't care. In the hallway, Raleigh took big steps. He was a good head taller than Luke and had longer legs. It was all Luke could do to keep up, what with the suitcase banging against his ankles. Raleigh looked back over his shoulder and started walking faster. He raced up a long stairway. By the time Luke reached the top, Raleigh was nowhere in sight. Boo! Raleigh leaped out from behind the newel post. Luke jumped so high he lost his balance and teetered on the edge of the stairs. Raleigh reached out and Luke thought, see, he's not so bad, he's going to catch me. But Raleigh pushed instead. 
Luke fell backwards. He might have tumbled down all the stairs, except that Raleigh's push was crooked and Luke landed on the railing. Pain shot through his back. Raleigh laughed. Got you good, didn't I? He said. Then strangely, he grabbed Luke's bag and took off down the hall. Luke was afraid he was stealing it. He galloped after Raleigh. Raleigh screamed with laughter maniacally. This was not what Luke had expected. Raleigh dodged around a corner and Luke followed him. Raleigh discovered a secret about Luke's bag that Luke had missed. It was on wheels. So Raleigh could run at full speed with the bag rolling behind him. He careened this way and that, the bag zigzagging from side to side. Luke got close enough to tackle it if he wanted, but he hesitated. If the bag had been full of his own clothes, all the hand-me-down jeans and flannel shirts he'd gotten after Matthew and Mark outgrew him, them, he would have leaped. But the bag held barren clothes, stiff shirts and shiny pants that were supposed to make him look like Lee Grant instead of Luke Garner. He couldn't risk ruining them. He focused on Raleigh instead. Instinctively, Luke dove over the bag to catch Raleigh's legs. It was like playing football. Raleigh fell to the ground with a crash. Just what is the meaning of this? A man's voice boomed above them. Raleigh was instantly on his feet. He attacked me, sir, Raleigh said. I was showing the new boy to his room and he attacked me. Luke opened his mouth to protest, but nothing came out. He'd learned that from Matthew and Mark. Don't tattle. The man looked dismissively from Raleigh to Luke. What is your name, young man? Luke froze. He had to stop himself from saying his real name automatically. Then he had a split second of fearing he wouldn't be able to remember the name he was supposed to use. Was he taking too long? The man's glare intensified. L -l -l Lee, Lee Grant, Lu Luke finally stammered. Well, Mr. Grant, the man snapped, this is a fine way to begin your academic career at Hendricks. You and Mr. Sturgeon each have two demerits for this disgraceful display. You may report to my room after the final bell to do your time. But sir, I told you, Raleigh protested, he attacked me. Very well, Mr. Sturgeon, make that three demerits for each of you. But Raleigh was undeterred. Four, Raleigh was going to complain again. Luke could tell by the way he was standing. But the man turned away and began walking down the hall as if Raleigh and Luke were both too unimportant to bother with, and he'd wasted enough time already. Luke's head swam with questions. What were demerits? When was final bell? Where was this man's room? Who was he anyway? Luke tried to muster up the nerve to call after the man or to ask Raleigh, which seemed even more dangerous, but then he was blindsided with a shove that sent him crashing into the wall. Fun roll, Raleigh exploded. Luke slumped against the wall. His shoulder throbbed. Why did Raleigh seem to hate him so much? Well, come on, you little ex -nay. Raleigh taunted. Want to get demerits for Mr. Dirk, too? He stepped backwards, tugging on Luke's suitcase. Then he shoved it through a nearby doorway. Luke looked up and saw 156 etched on a copper plaque on the door. Relief overwhelmed him. Finally, something made sense. This was his room. The rest of the day would be horrible. He'd already resigned himself to that. But eventually it would be night and he'd be sent to bed and he could come to this room and shut the door. And then he could read the note from Jen's dad if he didn't get a chance to read it before bedtime. Come nightfall, he'd know everything and be safe, alone in his own room. Imagining the haven that awaited him in only a matter of hours, he got brave enough to peek around the corner. The room held eight beds. Seven of them were made up with rich blue spreads stretched tautly from top to bottom. Only one, a lower bunk, was covered just by sheets. Luke felt as desolate as that bed looked. He knew it was his, and he knew he wouldn't get to be alone in this room. He probably wouldn't be safe either, not if any of his seven roommates were anything like Raleigh. He edged his hand into his pocket, his fingers brushing the note from Jen's dad. What if he just pulled it out and read it now, right in front of Raleigh? He didn't dare. The way the last 10 minutes had gone, Raleigh would probably rip the note to shreds before Luke even had it completely out of his pocket. And Jen's dad had acted like it was a secret. If Miss Hawkins wasn't supposed to see it, there was no way Raleigh could be trusted. Raleigh hit Luke on the shoulder. Tag, you're it, he hollered and took off running. Panicked, Luke chased after him. Chapter three. Luke managed to keep up with Raleigh only because Raleigh slowed to a dignified walk when he began passing classrooms instead of sleeping quarters. But it was a fast dignified walk and Luke was terrified that Raleigh might dart a cor around a corner unexpectedly and disappear. Then Luke would be totally lost. 
So Luke dared to jog a little, hoping to keep pace. A tall, thin man with a skimpy mustache came out of one of the rooms as Luke passed by. Two demerits, young man, he said to Luke. No running allowed. You know the rules. Luke didn't and didn't have the nerve to say so. Raleigh smirked. The thin man went back into his classroom. Luke knew he'd have to risk asking Raleigh a question. What he began, but just then Raleigh opened a tall wooden door to one side of the hall and slipped through. Luke's reflexes weren't fast enough. The door shut behind Raleigh and then Luke had to fumble with the knob. It was ornate and gold and had to be turned further to the right than all the doorknobs at home. Home. For the second time in less than an hour, Luke was overcome with an almost unbearable wave of homesickness. Stupid, Luke chided himself. How can you be homesick for doorknobs? Blinking quickly, he shoved on the door and it gave way. Blindly, he stepped in. He was at the back of a huge classroom. Boys sat in row upon row upon row, dozens of them, it seemed to Luke, all the way to the front of the room. There, the tall, thin man who'd just given Luke demerits was writing on the wall. Or was it the same man? Luke squinted, confused. Oh, there was a door at the front of the room too. That was the door the man had used, but had Luke and Raleigh really walked so far between the doors? Suddenly Luke wasn't sure of anything. Luke scanned the row of boys in front of him, looking for Raleigh. He was supposed to stay close to Raleigh, so that's what he'd do. But now he couldn't even remember if Raleigh had brown hair or black, short or long, curly or straight. He'd really never looked that closely at Raleigh, just followed him and gotten beat up by him. Any of the heads in front of him might belong to Raleigh. The man at the front of the class turned around and the Greeks were, sit down, he interrupted himself impatiently. He was looking at Luke, M me, Luke squeaked, well, where should I sit? His voice wasn't much more than a whisper. There was no way the man could have heard him all the way at the front of the room. Probably the boy sitting a foot away hadn't even heard him, but suddenly every boy in the room turned around and stared at Luke. It was awful. All those eyes all looking at him, it was straight out of Luke's worst nightmares. Panic rooted him to the spot, but every muscle in his body was screaming for him to run, to hide anywhere he could. For 12 years, his entire life, he'd had to hide. To be seen was death. Don't, he wanted to scream. Don't look at me. Don't report me, please. But the muscles that controlled his mouth were as frozen as the rest of him. The tiny part of his mind that wasn't flooded with panic knew that that was good. Now that he had a fake ID, the last thing he should do was act like a boy who's had to hide. But to act normal, he needed to move, to obey the man at the front and sit down. And he couldn't make his body do that either. Then someone kicked him. Ow, Luke crumpled. Rough hands jerked him backwards. Miraculously, he landed on the corner of a chair, barely regained his balance, and managed not to fall completely. He slid to his right and was solidly in the seat. Thank you, the man at the front said with exaggerated mocking gratitude. See me after class. As I was saying before I was so rudely interrupted, the Greeks were quite technologically advanced for their time. Then Luke could no longer hear the man's words over the buzzing in his ears. His heart kept thumping hard as if it, at least, still thought Luke would be wise to run. But Luke resolutely gripped the edge of the chair. He was acting normal now, wasn't he? The boys who had been staring at him slowly began turning back to face the teacher again. Luke wiped sweat from his forehead and looked around for whoever had kicked and pulled and shoved him. Had they been trying to help him? Luke desperately wanted to believe that, but all the boys near him were looking at the teacher nonchalantly as though Luke weren't even there. And if they'd been trying to help, wouldn't they be trying to catch Luke's eye to get him to say thanks? Luke really didn't know. He knew how his family would act. Mother and dad, Matthew and Mark, mother and dad would never kick him. And his older brothers would be poking him now, taunting him. Want us to kick you again? The only other people Luke had ever met before today were Jen's dad, who was practically as big a mystery as the boy sitting beside him now, and Jen. And Jen would... Luke couldn't bear to think about Jen. A bell rang suddenly and it was such an alarming sound that Luke's heart set to pounding again. Remember, chapter 12, the teacher called as all the boys scrambled up. Luke meant to go see the teacher as he'd been instructed. 
This had to be the end of the class, but the tide of boys swept him out the back door of the classroom before he quite knew what was happening. By the time he got his feet firmly on the ground and felt like he might be able to break away, he was around a corner and down in another hall. He fought his way back to what he thought was the original hallway, but then he couldn't figure out which way to turn. He looked all around, frantically searching for either the teacher or Raleigh, as nasty as he'd been. Raleigh was at least sort of familiar, but all the faces that flowed past him were strangers. Of course, the way Luke's mind was working, both Raleigh and the teacher could have paraded past Luke five times and he might not have even recognized them. The crowd in the hall was thinning out. Luke began to panic again. Get to class, an older boy standing nearby ordered him. Where, Luke said, where's my class? The boy didn't hear him. Luke thought about asking again louder, but the boy seemed to be some sort of guard, someone in charge, like a policeman, like the population police. Luke put his hand over his mouth and veered away down another hall. Another bell rang and boys started running, desperate to get into their classrooms. Hopelessly, Luke followed a group of three or four through a doorway into another classroom. At least he thought it was another classroom. For all he knew, he might have circled around and gone to the same one all over again. Maybe that was good. Maybe after class this time, he could make it up to talk to the teacher. It was a short fat man who stood up to talk this time. As confused and panicky as Luke felt, even he could tell it wasn't the same teacher. Luke hastily sat down, terrified of drawing attention to himself again. He resolved to listen carefully this time, to pay attention and learn. He owed it to everyone, to mother and dad, to Jen's father, even to Jen herself. It was 10 minutes before he realized that the man at the front was speaking some other language, one Luke had never heard before and didn't have a prayer of understanding.